Chapter 12, Stay Away From My Crime Scene. I knew I'd end up cruising in an unmarked patrol car one day, but I always figured I'd be the one driving it. I told Star as we purred down Mr. Jesse's drive in Star's dirt-colored Impala. Briars crowded, briars crowded a path squeaking down the sides of the car. Driving, you're lucky you're not in handcuffs. It's illegal to disturb a crime scene. I didn't cross your tape, I said, brushing my wet hair from my face. I came in on the creek perfectly legal. If you don't believe me, ask Eater, my attorney in training. Stargrin, funny name for an attorney. I thought so too, but I didn't like him saying it. The colonel says that all attorneys should be named for blood-sucking insects, so we know up front who we're dealing with. I said, Stars grinned, widened. He looks younger when he smiles. His eyes crinkle and the sides of his mouth dimples. I could almost see why Miss Retzel might like him. You can't interfere with an investigation no matter what your friend says. I wasn't interfering. I was finding the murder weapon, I said as we rounded the bend. Hey, you better slow down. Most of the town is at the end of this drive. Waiting for the word on the murder. Besides, I added, folks are going to want to see who's riding with you. Star tapped the brakes as the crowd came into view. I rolled down my window. Hey, Mr. Lee, I found the murder weapon, I shouted. Mr. Lee waved. Very good, Mo. Ask Miss Lane to double my fries. I'm starving. Me too, shouted Les. Sal dar darted to the window. Mo, Anna Celeste said she and her mom are eating free of charge today. I didn't know what to do. Blackmail. Attila had enough on Dale and his whereabouts the night of the murder to shake me down for eternity. Another reason to clear Dale's name. I'll handle it, Sal, thanks. Star sped up and the crowd parted. Buckle up, he said, his voice like gunmetal. Pretty snazzy ride, I said, clicking my seatbelt and waving to a clump of high school kids. You get to drive this over to Miss Retzel's for dating? How long have you known her anyway? As a rising sixth grader, grader, I got the right to know. You ask too many questions. Occupational hazard, detective, I added before he could ask. He snorted. Huh. It takes years of training to become a detective. Lucky, I didn't know that earlier, I said, lifting the radio from its hook. You wouldn't have a murder weapon. Speaking of which, you sending my ore to the lab? We don't know if it is the murder weapon, he said, putting the radio back on its hook. But yes, my deputy bagged it for the lab. You find any other clues out there? One investigator to another? Nothing comes to mind, he said. He shot me a look. How about you? You know this town. What's your take? One investigator to another. So that was why he was being nice. He wanted my clues. Beats me. You could let me out of the at you could let me out at the head of that path. I gotta pick up my bike. He didn't even slow down. I don't mind giving you a lift to the cafe. I don't want you out by yourself. Besides, I like to, I'd like like to have a word with the colonel. My confidence wobbled like a bike in heavy sand. The colonel? I said. Yeah, that's not a problem, is it? I shrugged. Not for me, I said, hoping I was right. A few minutes later, Star parked beside the colonel's underbird and followed me into the cafe. Come in, Miss Lane is saying from the kitchen. I'll be with you in a minute. Star swept off his hat. Things have changed a little since I was here, he said. That was an understatement. You could tell who's running the cafe the instant you walk through the door. The colonel keeps the cafe military crisp. Miss Lane prefers a theme. Glancing around, I pegged today's theme as 1930s Paris, her favorite. A miniature Eiffel Tower graced the counter, and scratchy accordion music crackled from the ancient Victrolia that she placed near the jukebox. A red for Mica, the red for Mica table sported white lace cloths, which she turned catty corner, lending the cafe a bohemian flair. The blackboard behind the counter read Le Menu. Bonjour, Miss Elena said, backing through the kitchen, swinging doors, her calf Limp, pale pink dress clung to her body like a fine, shimmering mold. Welcome to La Cafe, she willed gracefully, placing a tray of sparkling glasses on the counter and beamed at Joe Star. Mo, where are your manners? Take the gentleman's hat, she said, picking up her fan. And with a practiced 
flick of her wrist, snapped it open. Welcome, Mon Capjon. When Miss Lena gets goes into character, she goes into character. I popped Star's hat onto the counter. He ain't a captain, he's a detective, I said, wiggling my eyebrows in the universal recognized sign as be quiet. He's here about the murder. She ignored me. Why, sir, unless you're on duty? Ice tea, Star said, his eyes traveling past Miss Lena's Jean Harlow swig to the 1930s black and white Hollywood photos on the wall. I elbowed back into the conversation. Detective Joe Star, this is Miss Lena. Miss Lena, Detective Joe Star, the one I told you about, the one investigating Mr. Desi's murder. Are those our lunches over there? Yes, sugar, she said, glancing at the neat row of brown paper bags lining the counter. All packed up and ready to go. Sal brought me the takeout list. She said Anna's lunch was prepaid. Right, I said, cutting her short. I got her money right here. You want to carry some of these lunches out for me? I asked her. Maybe give me a ride back to the driveway. Folks are hungry and you're a public servant after all. Now he ignored me. It's slow for lunchtime, he said to Miss Lena. Well, naturally, no one's thinking of the cafe today. All eyes are on you. Star glanced at the cafe's one occupied table. Miss Lena's lone customer had slumped forward, cradling his head in his arms. Too much wine, Star asked, nodding toward the man. She sighed. Too much drink well before he arrived at my door. She picked up the coffee pot and swayed across the room and carefully topped off the man's cup. He sat up and focused blearily in our direction. Crud. Dale's daddy. Could my day get any worse? Hey, Mo, Mr. Mason mumbled. He looked horrible, like time had grabbed his face with both hands and stretched the life right out of him. Hey, I muttered, heading for the jukebox. Maybe if I stood here long enough, he'd go back to sleep. Dale was the last name. I wanted to come up with Star in the room. Where's the Colonel? I'd like to have a word with him if you don't mind. The Colonel? Miss Lena hesitated. Why? I don't believe he's here. Then again, he's so hard to keep up with. Such a mercurial personality, she smiled. Is his car out front? Yes, ma'am. Go to the kitchen and call him, sugar. Maybe he's out back fishing. If he is, he ain't the only one, I thought. I shot Dale's daddy a quick look. Out cold again, thank heavens. I tromped through the kitchen to the side door and cupped my hands around my mouth. Colonel! I called so Star could hear me. Miss Lena wants you! I waited a minute and came back inside. Very well, detective, Miss Lena was saying. Two hamburgers to go. Pity you're not staying for lunch. We could be get better acquainted. The colonel didn't answer me. I guess he couldn't hear me, I said. That man will be the death of me, she sighed, giving Star a baleful look. Oh, he'll come slipping back in when I least expect it with some ridiculous story about a bass or... What are those other things he talks about, sugar? Catfish, I suggested. It was all bunk. The idea of the colonel fishing. The colonel's only fishing story involved a stick of dynamite and a bushel basket. Catfish, of course, she said, beaming. She smiled her most leisurely smile, but moved like lightning as she slapped Star's hamburgers together, folded them in the crisp tissue, and put them in a bag. She wanted Star gone as bad as I did. There you are, on the house, she said, sliding the bag toward him. Thanks anyway, he said, putting a tin on the counter. Keep the change. Très bien, she sang au revoir. Merci, Star muttered, heading for the door. Oh, he said, turning. You haven't mentioned the murder, which I find odd. That's the first thing most folks ask about. Well, pardonnez-moi. How is your investigation going, detective? Fine, and don't worry about not asking. After all, there are a few things I haven't asked you. For instance, any idea who might want Jesse Tatum dead? I stood behind Star, waving my arms, mouthing the words as Miss Lena studied me. She shrugged delicately. Well, his girlfriend may have wanted him dead or her jealous husband. I'm sure you know about them. Selma and Albert Foster from Kinston. I went dizzy. Those are my best clues. You know them then? Star said, taking out his pen. No, but you hear things when you run a cafe. Star nodded. 
And where were you on the night of Jesse Tatum died? On a Greyhound coming home from Charleston. Alone, she smiled. In the ex existential sense, we all travel alone, don't we? At times, I feel it's like a dull, aching pain right here, she said, bringing her hand to her heart. Don't you, like a child yearning to go home? Star frowned. Right. I had the same thing last Thursday, but I'm asking more about the alibi sense of things. Were you alone physically? I was on a bus, she said, her smile slipping. I'm sure that will be easy to confirm. Star nodded and snapped his patch up. Probably so. I'll find out for you. You want to ride back to Jesse Tatum's driveway, Mo? Before I could say yes, Miss Layden's hand fell on my shoulders. No, thank you, Detective. I'll drive her back. Now what? Miss Lena can't drive? One more question, Star said. Somebody mentioned seeing a boy near, near Mr. Jesse's the day he died. Scrawny kid, blonde hair, black t-shirt. Any idea who that was? My goodness, surely you don't suspect a child. I've seen murders done by kids younger than Mo. there. Shrinks, have bad, shrinks say bad parenting to blame, but who knows? Yes, they can be such mad dogs, the poor dear, she said, patting my head. Behind me, Dale's daddy's chair scrubbed against the floor. Hold it right there, you slick-talking son of a gun, he slurred. Mason, Miss Lena cried. Mr. Mason rose unsteadily, his face twisted in rage. There ain't nothing wrong with the way I'm raising my boy, he said, his voice said. If anybody's to blame for the way he's turned out, it's his mama. Ain't that right, Mo? Who does she think she is? Tell me, get out of my own house. Miss Rose threw you out? Does Dale know? Because it's news to me. Mo, hush, Miss Lena said. Mr. Mason glared at her. Dale don't need nothing he ain't getting from me. Tell me, sir, your kid got blonde hair, likes to wear black t-shirts? Mr. Mason lurched across the room. So what if he does? Leave my boy alone, he said, jabbing a finger into Star's chest. Star stepped back lightly, like a cat. Don't nobody tell Dale what to do except me. He's a good boy. Ain't he a good boy, Mo? Dale? Star kept his gaze on Mr. Mason, but I knew he was talking to me. That's your friend, isn't it, Mo? The spooky kid I met the first time I came in here? I didn't answer. He turned back to Mr. Mason. Where's your son now? Probably home with that no good mother of his. Throw me out of my own house after I treated her like gold all these years. Oh, for heaven's sakes, Miss Lena said, her hands on her hips. That house is Rose's, not yours. Her father left it to her. If it wasn't for her good name and good graces, you'd have been locked up years ago. You never gave her anything except for a couple good-looking kids, a mountain of bills, and a heart turned to stone with grief. She turned to Star. I've known Dale since he was a baby, and I've never known a gentler soul. I can't even pay him to kill a garden snake. The idea that he murdered Jesse is ludicrous. Please stop wasting time on him and find the killer. We're all worried to death. Star stared at her a moment. Miss Lena, I need to talk to Dale and his mother. If you see them, please tell them I'll be at Jesse Tatum's place all afternoon. If I don't see them by the end of the day, I'll come looking for them. And when the colonel gets in, let him know I'd like to talk to him too. You, he said, looking at me. Stay away from thy crime scene, and you, sir, he said, looking at Dell's daddy. If you ever jab your finger in my chest again, you'll wake up in handcuffs. Are we clear? When we didn't answer, he smiled. I thought so, he said, and he headed for the door.